anniversary. That's true. Yeah, so while my laptop's restarting, I'll just uh, talk a bit, I guess. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is um, the title of the talk is Solving a uh, Highly Concurrent Problem in Go. Um, this is a Ruby meetup, so I want to talk about why you as a Rubyist, as someone who works primarily in Ruby or is very interested in Ruby, might be interested in adding Go, Go to your tool set. What are the things that Go does that are complementary to Ruby? And uh, I think probably many people in here have looked at Go before, but the really differentiating feature of the language is uh, its concurrency primitives. And so uh, rather than rehash an intro to the language or something that you could just watch on YouTube, uh, I'm going to talk about a problem that we had at CodeGuard that uh, I used Go to solve it and why the concurrency uh, support that's built into Go was very important uh, and uh, impacted the way in which I solved the problem and the way uh, how well the solution worked. So hopefully my computer will boot up this time. Okay, thanks. It's working. Okay, so Gopher is a tool that um, I built to access Amazon S3, uh, and it offers uh, streaming concurrent transfers to Amazon S3, uh, as well as um, end end integrity checking of those transfers, so going in and coming out, uh, as well as a command line interface. It's also a package, so if you do uh, want to use it in a Go program, you can use it as a package. Uh, and it was, uh, the results of building it were that it's 34 times faster than what we were using before. Well, what uh, were you using before? Well, I'll get into that. <laughs> uh, so to understand uh, kind of the problem space, uh, the solution, uh, to understand that, you need to understand the problem space a bit. So. At CodeGuard, uh, our main product is uh, website backups. Uh, we do backup uh, for any, backup, any uh, website that's accessible over FTP or SFTP, and we also do backups of databases, um, MySQL databases. Um, and we store those backups in S3 uh, for a variety of reasons, but S3, uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's Amazon Simple Storage Service. Um, and it's a highly available, highly secure and robust uh, storage solution, key-based, and um, storing our backups in there is a you know a good business. Uh, there's good business reasons for that, but it also means that we have to get those backups out to update them because we do incremental backups every day. Um, if anything changes on a person's website, so. Our backups grow, and they're incremental, and for some of our enterprise users, those backups were starting to exceed half a terabyte. And CodeGuard is startup, so we started out as a monolithic Ruby on Rails app, and everything kind of lived in that, even as it transitioned more towards really being a back-end system with the front end being kind of incidental. And um, 
this transferring into and out of S3 was starting to really drive our Amazon EC2 costs, which is uh, the virtual servers in the Amazon cloud, because it was taking so long to do these transfers. So to answer your question of what we were using, uh, we were using the AWS SDK kind of by default. I mean, when you're building a, a Ruby on Rails app, what else uh, would you use? It works for most things. Um, and if you're moving small amounts of small sizes of files that a lot of web applications are doing, it works just fine. Uh, but on the orders of magnitude that we were dealing with, it uh, kind of showed its brittleness. Uh, one interesting thing about it is they don't actually set the, set the content MD5 header when they're transferring up to Amazon, which is you know, directly uh, a contradiction of Amazon's own recommendation. I don't know why. Maybe that calls for a pull request. Uh, but it had very poor uh, checking of over the wire transfers, and uh, we started to see some corruption in some of our data, as well as just uh, uploads, especially multi-part uploads, uh, would frequently fail. Uh, in Amazon S3, anything that's over five gigabytes has to be uploaded in multiple parts, uh, and that became an increasingly large percentage of our um, transfers. So. The, they would often fail, and then we'd have to restart at zero. And so uh, you can imagine with the uh, speeds that you're seeing there, uh, that's a nine gigabyte object, which for us has become uh, average. Those speeds quickly mean that daily backup is essentially impossible. Uh, also, from a business standpoint, if our, if our data, uh, customer's data is corrupt, we just you know, lost all our value for them. If we don't have their backups, we don't have their data, then we don't have a whole lot. So it's a critical thing that uh, what we have for them does not get corrupted and that it's stored securely. Okay, so isn't there already a solution out there for this? Uh, if you've worked with Amazon S3, you've probably seen a dozen tools to so, you know, that give you access to S3 or use a different SDK. Um, I looked into a lot of different things. Um, I mean, there's JetSet, there's S3 Command, there's Boto, there's the Amazon Web Services um, command line interface, which at the time I started looking at this was not, had not gone 1.0 yet. Um, so you could make an argument that you might be able to use that because um, it's actually fairly comprehensive. But as far as like S3 command and JetSet, which is a Java tool, um, they, they didn't have some of the features that we needed because we need to be able to set, for instance, metadata headers. Um, and they also, in testing, just turned out to be fairly brittle at the really large object sizes we were dealing with. Um, it, it seems like either what we do, at least at the scale we do that, is fairly unusual or um, you know, there's a problem out there and people just deal with it by retrying. Uh, so I'm not saying there wasn't uh, a solution that could have worked, uh, but a lot of the ones we looked into just didn't really satisfy the problem. They were certainly better, but they weren't uh, where we wanted to go. They also, uh, I'm not aware of any of uh, these S3 tools that I've talked about that have streaming support. And I'll talk a bit later about why that is important to us. Uh, by streaming support, I mean like you can hook this up to a pipe, a Unix pipe, and stream data into or out of it. Uh, so it's not writing directly to disk. Uh, and that's really what makes this problem a little more complex. You know, you think, okay, parallel downloads and uploads, not hard. But if you have to do them uh, with a stream, it becomes a little more complicated. And that's really where Go's concurrency primitives um, made solving this problem a lot easier. So why use Go for this? Well, partly just because I was looking at it. Um, uh, you know, this isn't a problem that is, you can only be solved in one language. It's certainly not making that claim. Um, but uh, for anyone, you know, anyone who's looked into Go will know that um, one of its, you know, unique features is uh, the concurrency support built into the language and um, that really came into handy in solving this problem. So 
just to clarify, goes um, concurrency is built on an idea from a paper in 1978 by Tony Hoare. Um, so it's not a new idea, but in terms of mainstream languages, not that goes a mainstream language yet, but you know, languages that have gained a lot of popularity, it's probably the first one, uh, with the possible exception of Erlang, um, and the you know the way that it does with the actor model, which is a little bit different, uh, to implement uh, CSPs or communicating sequential processes. So. One thing that it does that really makes it unique is building it into the language and into the runtime. Uh, you know, you can implement these ideas in many languages, but having them built into the library, or not as a library, but built into the runtime, changes the way you structure programs. And uh, it came in, it became very useful in solving this problem. So just briefly, if you haven't heard of Go or haven't really looked into it yet, uh, Started at Google as a 20% project, although I kind of feel like uh, Ken Thompson doesn't really have 20% time. Uh, but that's ostensibly how it started by Ken Thompson, uh, Rob Pike, both of uh, like Bell Labs Heritage, and then um, Rob Griesemer. Uh, very different backgrounds, at least in terms of Rob, uh, Gries uh, Rob Griesemer. And I think that shows in the way the language is designed. Uh, I don't really have, you know, can't really go into that in the time I have. Uh, but it is compiled, it's statically typed, although the way that interfaces work, um, if you use interfaces in Java, a lot of the problems or the frustrations about interfaces that I think a lot of people have are addressed in Go. And they really allow essentially uh, duck typing, but in a statically compiled language. Um, it is garbage collected. Uh, this is actually very important when you're dealing with really concurrent problems. Um, memory management can quickly become a nightmare when you're dealing with a lot of things happening at once. And so making it a garbage collected language was a uh, careful but deliberate decision to manage that stuff. And the nice thing is if you want to, you can manage your own memory, uh, but you don't have to. Um, it is object oriented, although uh, via composition, not inheritance. And it is truly open source. All the uh, discussions about what's going to happen in language are done on a public mailing list. Uh, and more, con more contributors are outside Go than, or outside Google than inside Google uh, by a large margin. So it's not open source like Android. It's open source like you might want open source to be. Um, so just a brief sort of uh, hello world uh, to give you a feel for how the uh, how the language looks, how it works. Um, it's, it looks a lot kind of C-like, I think. Uh, you know, people that have used a C-like language before will recognize the syntax. Um, it's fairly terse. And this is just, uh, it starts an HTTP server and then serves, uh, responds hello and the, the URL path. Uh, so that main function, all Go programs that are executable have a main function, which is the function that executes. Um, and then the package is called main, where the execution starts. Uh, it imports two other packages, the FUMPT package, which provides uh, formatting, and the net HTTP package. So um, if I click run here, that compiles and starts um, that program. That's not a very large program, but for instance, the net HTTP package is actually quite large, and you can see how fast that compiled. Uh, one of the features of Go is just is extremely fast compilation. You can build the entire standard library in, I think, around two seconds or less. So it feels like a scripting language in a lot of ways. So just to show you that it's working, we can go there and then you can sort of see that. And then we can zoom back. All right, so that's that. So in order to sort of explain a little bit of how this was, uh, the concurrency primitives were very useful to, um, to solving this problem, I need to explain how Go does concurrency. It's not really that complicated. There are two main features of the language. Uh, those are 
that are used for concurrency, go routines, and channels. And uh, so I'm just going to go over them quickly, hopefully um, in enough detail that uh, it makes sense when I move on to a little more code. So a go routine, you can think of it as a first, pro first approximation, like a very lightweight thread. Um, and that's very Im important for concurrency, um, being able to just spawn things without them having high system costs. Uh, the system call stack grows and shrinks as necessary, um, but it starts at four kilobytes. You can run literally hundreds of thousands of these on one server. And uh, in the talk that Rob Pike, one of the creators of Go, gave you last year, he showed um, an example where uh, he basically did sort of like the Chinese telephone game where you know he passed the message on, creating Go routines and channels. Uh, each, each one talking to the next one and then creating a new one, uh, 100,000 of them. And I think it took you know, about less than a second to run. So it's a, it's a very realistic thing running a lot of these things. Um, and for, for certain applications, that's pretty powerful. Um, contrast that with a thread, which by default in Linux is eight megabytes, although you can change that. Um, you don't really have to worry how they're handled, and you can have many Go routines per thread because they're handled by the runtime. Uh, in most cases, it isn't really a factor. So Go routines communicate via channels, and one concept that kind of helped me to get it when I first started looking into this was, uh, you know, again the Unix pipe. Um, when you write to a Unix pipe, and the the program on the other end, the receiver is not ready, it's going to be blocking. Uh, and the same as when you read. So it's a blocking communication, uh, and that's really what Go routines uh, are as well. They are, they provide synchrony and communication in the same feature because they're basically a pipe of zero length. So if the receiver's not ready, the sender's going to block until the receiver can receive whatever you're sending on that channel. Channels are typed, so in this example we have a channel of integers. Uh, you send in with that operator, um, and you can remember which way a channel is sending just by looking at the where the arrow is pointing. Uh, and then you can receive out of that channel, uh, and then n will be set to 7. So nothing useful there, but it sort of demonstrates how they work. And the mantra of Go, I'm not sure if Rob Pike actually came up with this you know, saying, but he likes to say it, uh, is don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. And so that's really the idea with Go routines and channels, is that you send stuff on channels uh, to um, communicating se sequential processes. So within the processes, there is no parallelism necessarily, but uh, each thing does what it needs to do with that piece of um, memory, data, whatever, and then it passes it on to the next thing. And that can all ha happen concurrently, and there's no mutexes, no semaphores. Uh, and so you can focus on writing the code rather than dealing with deadlocks and um, a lot of the really thorny things about concurrency. Okay, so to, in order to kind of show how I used uh, these things in, the, uh, in Gopher, uh, I'm just going to show parts of the, the getter or the, the, the downloading part. Um, so getter in terms of HTTP parlance, uh, S3 uses a REST API. Um, so that's the way I interacted with S3. So uh, these are all the things that it needs to do, some of them at the same time as other things. Uh, and so you know, it needs to first find out how large an object is so it can figure out how many chunks it's going to break it up into. And break it, break it up. Every request, of course, has to be signed in the special weird Amazon way so that Amazon will accept the request uh, using the AWS keys uh, that authenticate that account. And you have to request each chunk, download each chunk, and then uh, because this is streaming, all this stuff has to be written out sequentially to arbitrarily sized buffers. Uh, and that's kind of where it becomes you know, more of an interesting problem. You're not just getting a chunk and writing it out to this part spot on the disk you have to rearrange them and then output them sequentially. Uh, and you know, a somewhat similar process occurs on the upload in reverse. Uh, of course, if anything, any errors occur during any 
part of this process in any of the go routines that are working on the problem, you have to handle that error and then as it occurs, when it occurs, and if you can't recover, you know, pass that error out to the um, user or the you know, customer of the application. It also calculates an MD5 hash over the entire sequential stream uh, so that that can be put into Amazon for verification later as well as then you get it out and uh, you don't have to trust Amazon that way. Um, there's other applications that do it, um, although I don't think any of them do it sequentially. Uh, and that has to be done in parallel across all the chunks. So kind of the parallelism, parallel or the, yeah, the concurrency stuff kind of starts with this uh, function, which is called as a go routine. So the way you call uh, a go routine, if you remember that from the previous slide, is you have a function and you simply call go and the name of that function. So in the initializer, which is not on here, it simply calls go init chunks. And in this case, uh, I don't worry about returning. Um, and it simply just runs through over the entire size of the object, creating chunks. And then it writes to that channel at the bottom. So uh, th that, that channel is um, defined on the getter type. So that G is, is a getter. Uh, and so all these methods or functions are defined on that type. And it simply writes into that channel. One of the nice things is this is a blocking channel. So it's not going to make all these chunks and put them in memory. Although it wouldn't, you know, in this case, it wouldn't be that expensive. But it's only going to create the chunks as they're read off the channel by workers. So you already get, you know, some, uh, some nice advantages here just in that this thing is only going to create them as they can be used simply by the blocking uh, tech, uh, characteristics. So I mentioned the workers. Um, they're created in the initialization function. Basically, just go, you know, there's a configurable amount of concurrency you can have. Uh, so, you know, by default, I usually use like 20. Um, and those things aren't necessarily going to going to correspond to threads. Uh, although if they block, they can. And, you know, that's usually plenty of workers. Yeah. Um, quick question. Um, for the channel, um, yeah. I, I know you said it's uh, um, synchronous in terms of, you know, you could pass stuff in and it's blocking, but you can actually um, give it a side, can't you? That's true, you can. Um, so there's this also, yeah, there's this notion of buffered channels, and those are not, you know, obviously are not blocking. Yeah. So why did you choose to go this route as opposed to buffer? Well, you lose that that uh, synchronization capability if you go with a buffer channel. I actually am using a buffer channel uh, in part of this uh, because I implemented buffer pooling to recycle memory buffers. And so that buffer pool is implemented as a buffer channel. Uh, but in general, um, yeah, I mean, because of the synchronization stuff, uh, there wasn't anything that I can think of that I would gain by buffering. Uh, you already have like this characteristic of buffering simply by doing all this stuff concurrently. If you know what I mean, like you, uh, one, of, one of the ways, um, I'll talk a little bit about the performance later, but one of the ways in which this thing, I think really beats a lot of other tools in performance is that it doesn't need to always be reading from disk because it can get work and then work on it. Uh, and that's especially true um, you know, on the downloads where it's just going to start downloading and then write it out as it can get disk access. So as long as init is way faster than whatever is on the other side of init, there's not really any advantage to it. Or as long as what's ever on the other side of init is way slower than init, it doesn't really, yeah. you don't really gain yeah. anything by buffering. Right, like in this case, iterating over a for loop is a lot faster than getting things out of S3. Um, okay, so, um, not to go too much into the detail of this code, but uh, this, you know, here's the code where we actually download the data. Um, you know, this is, uh, sorry, did I, I don't think I finished talking about workers. Okay, so that range function there actually is, is, is kind of interesting. That means that as, uh, read from that channel until the channel is closed. So when the chunks, uh, when the last chunk is put on that channel, it will be closed and that 
channel will be closed, and all those workers will be deallocated and garbage collected. Uh, and because it's an atomic operation to read or write, read from or write to a channel, I don't have to worry about how many workers I create or anything like that. Uh, they're going to read uh, parts off without, you know, in a thread safe way. Uh, and then it calls retry get trunk, which just has, you know, some code in to retry things if they fail. Um, which is actually, uh, I was surprised how many tools I looked into didn't do that because, you know, anytime you're doing network communication, a lot of things can go wrong. Amazon S3, when you're really shoving data at it, often resets connections. And in the SDK, at least it's implemented right now, that means you start at zero. Uh, okay, so the, the get chunk in this case, um, pretty standard HTTP stuff. It uh, makes a um, request, puts the, um, puts the range of bytes that it wants to get in the, in the header, uh, because we're doing range downloads for this, and then um, signs that request. That's what that sign function is for. And uh, then actually executes it, and then reads from the body of the response, which is where the data is, until it's closed, uh, checks the status code. Um, and you can see in here, uh, error checking in Go is, is kind of verbose. Um, Talk a little more about that later, but um, I actually took a couple of error checks out just you know so it would fit on the slide. But uh, it certainly makes it more verbose, um, and it's kind of their answer to the problems of exceptions. But it does tend to make code more verbose than say Ruby. Uh, no question about that. So once it has that data in a buffer, which a buffer uh, is a on this basically a, a chunk is a struct type and a buffer is a, you know, a point or two, a buffer in memory on that. It's going to put that, actually the whole chunk, on a channel of chunks, that read channel, and then the read function uh, will handle the reordering and sequential writing out of uh, the data to the stream, uh, you know, to the reader, so that um, no matter how the chunks are downloaded, they will be written out in the order the sequential order, and there you have streaming. Uh, so I wanted to, I was hoping to get a little more um, data, but I didn't have time to uh, show more comprehensive comparison data, although I have done some comparisons. Um, the, you know, I showed that it was faster than SDK, at least as we were using it. Uh, that's, you know, the Ruby SDK. There are other AWS uh, language SDKs. Uh, I haven't looked into those as much, um, and they weren't really something we wanted to do because we have this Ruby application, like, you know, we didn't want to do some kind of weird cross-language thing. Uh, and this thing actually has a command line interface, so that's how we use it. Uh, there's a command line interface package built into Gopher, and so anyone can use it that way. And that's how we're using it. I'll show in a second how we call it. Uh, so it basically maxes out a gigabit connection on an S3 on a EC2 instance. Actually, I did all these tests on a M2 2x large, uh, which is the instance type we normally use at CoGuard. Uh, so it's a high memory instance, but it's a, according to Amazon at least, a moderate networking. They don't define what that is, uh, but uh, suffice it to say, it maxes out the gigabit connection. So if you've heard of the noisy neighbor problem, I think we're the noisy neighbor in this. <laughs> Uh, but hey, that's, they let us do it. So it pretty consistently gets these performances on both uploads and downloads. It, it'll basically max out a gigabit connection. Um, and what's interesting about it is it'll also do it um, with you know less CPU usage than say Boto, which is implemented in Python. You know, not that surprisingly, since it's a compiled language, and um, with you know significantly less memory than some of the other solutions out there. Even though it is streaming, so it has to do some things in memory, uh, implementing the buffer pool uh, reduced it to basically the number of buffers you have times the size of the buffers is the amount of memory this thing will use, plus about 20 megs of overhead. So, you know, in, in the way we're using it, we, it'll use, you know, 400 megabytes or something, which is, you know, trivial compared to how much memory our... Um, our uh, Rails application is often using. 
so I think I can say it's the fastest streaming client out there. I haven't tested any clients that are faster than it, period. Um, the one thing that came pretty close was um, Boto. There's a tool out there called like multi-part upload. Uh, it's on GitHub and multi-part download, but it uses Boto and then you know just takes care of the multi-part stuff for you because uh, it's actually multi-part uploads are kind of complex when you get into them on Amazon. And uh, that came pretty close, um, but used a lot more memory and a lot more CPU to do it and spawned 20 threads versus, you know, three or four. Um, so the end-to-end -end integrity checking actually has been kind of a win. I know there are some other clients that do it, like uh, JetSet does have capability to do that. Uh, of course, uh, you can put stuff in the header, and we do, but you can't put the MD5 in the header, uh, although this, it, it does currently have the capability of doing that. Like there's a non-streaming mode uh, gopher that has where it'll put in the header, like it'll read over the file first, calculate the MD5, and then put it in the header, but you can't do that when you're streaming because you don't know what the MD5 is until you're done. So, you know, it puts it in a file and then knows where, where to get that file in the download. But it's nice because we don't have to trust Amazon, we don't have to trust that, you know, some HTTP error didn't get caught. And uh, I've definitely seen in production where we've had to retry downloads because the MD5 didn't match. So uh, it's a real issue for us when you talk about hundreds of gigabytes uh, coming in and out of S3. So since it's been in production, it's been, it's been almost three months of the day since it went live. And it's moved about one petabyte of data. And um, we've had no failures in production that we know of, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really not like, you know, that's not because I'm great at coding. I think that really is a testament to Go's uh, concurrency primitives and the way it lets you structure a piece of software so that it's easy to think about it and easy to handle um, the edge cases. Uh, so this is a little bit of Ruby code, how we use it in production. So we use POSIX spawn, if you're familiar with that. Um, it allows you to shell out without a lot of memory copying and forking. Um, it's a Ruby gem, it's pretty cool. If you do a lot of shelling out, it's very nice. Um, but you can see there, we, we actually tar up all our backups and then we untar them. What we were doing before is we download that tarball onto the disk and then untar it on the same disk. And that's an, you know, an IO nightmare. So everything was limited by IO. It's still limited by IO, but uh, to, well, some things are limited by IO, uh, but to a much lesser extent because what hits the disk is what we want to use. It's actually the directory fully untarred and decompressed um, and that's kind of where streaming was really important to us and actually might be useful in a lot of other applications uh, for people that are, uh, need to work with the data, especially if they want to compress it or do some sort of uh, you know, encapsulation of data before they send it to S3. So that's kind of where um, the streaming was, kind of, was a big win for us. Actually, when it, I first rolled it out, it was not streaming and it had almost no effect. It was really disappointing. Then once, uh, once I implemented the streaming functionality, which wasn't a big change, but it just, you know, hadn't done it, uh, it was, you know, that 34x, which is, you know, that's kind of like the best case scenario, right? For small objects, it's not going to be that much better. Uh, but anytime we have big objects, the concurrency comes into play. Um, and, you know, we saw 10, 20x um, performance increases. So it's open source, you can find it there. Uh, well, actually you can find the API there. Um, one thing that you know, is nice about Go, it has a lot of great tooling. So just like Ruby has RDoc, uh, Go has GoDoc. And the, the nice thing is you get GoDoc simply by uploading to GitHub or Bitbucket or any of these major services. And um, there's no, you don't have to gemify it or anything, it's simply, uh, indexes your API or indexes your tool, grabs the API stuff out, and then uh, you get that stuff for free. And then other people can search on godoc.org for your package. So if someone wants to look for an S3 package, 
That's why I called it S3 Gopher, SEO. Uh, even though the tool itself is called Gopher, because if I don't call it S3 Gopher, no one will ever find it. Um, and you know, does it really matter that it's implemented in Go? I mean, I think I showed that in terms of the implementation, it does. But in terms of someone using it, no. But you know, Go is popular now, so why not? So, a little plug for CodeGuard. Hope you like the beers. And if problems like this seem interesting to you, uh, we're hiring. Uh, I know, you know they're really fascinating to me because uh, you know it's kind of like beyond just a web application. Like we're moving pretty large amounts of data and have to solve some interesting problems like this, uh, and you know pushing the limits of some of Amazon services. Although in some ways we're not pushing the limits at all. Um, but we're growing very fast, and this tool kind of came at the right time to, to solve some of our problems where we, you know, our promise of daily backup wasn't going to be real for some people if we didn't, uh, get, if we didn't get this thing figured out. So um, aside from the concurrency stuff, you know, what's, what are some downsides to go from sort of a Ruby perspective? Um, well, it's very different from Ruby. Some people compare it to C. I actually think it's a kind of a poor comparison. I've written, written more C code than I've written Ruby. Um, like before I joined CodeGuard, I worked in embedded medical devices. And although the syntax is superficially similar, the way that you structure programs and the way you write programs in a garbage collected concurrent language is just so different that I think, you know, C is more like Ruby than Gopher is like Ruby, or sorry, you know, they're just not the same. I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I'm writing C. Actually, when I first looked at Go a couple years ago, I kind of passed it off as like, oh, C, I, I write C, I don't really need to learn that. And, you know, I think that I was wrong. Error handling's verbose. Um, there's no generics yet, at least. Some people really care about that. I haven't ran into a problem, but I haven't written a lot of Go code where that was a critical factor. Uh, dependency management is actually kind of a problem right now. Um, there's not like a bundler type tool People are working on solutions. The Go team's answer is sort of, uh, it's an unsolvable problem, which is technically true. But you know, so is like programs never, comp you know, you can't prove that a program will complete, but we don't let that stop us. Um, so people are working on solutions. The answer right now is, you know, for production systems can be like, you know, basically vendoring all your dependencies. Uh, for Gopher, you know, just out of interest, I, I only used one non-standard library package, uh, and that was for parsing the command line flag. So the standard library is actually pretty comprehensive. Um, so things I like about it, um, really excellent tooling. Um, just, uh, yeah, good tooling. Uh, you saw the Godoc stuff that's, you know, part of the tooling. It, for a language that's only four years released into the wild, it's pretty amazing how mature it feels. Um, cross compilation is awesome. Uh, you know, we develop on, on Macs and deploy on Linux, like many people. And cross compiling on the Mac for Linux is, you know, one line command, super easy. And you can cross compile for any of the target operating systems of the compiler, um, just the same. Statically linked binaries also kind of, you know, Surprisingly, maybe maybe surprisingly, maybe not, but awesome. No dependencies. You don't have to worry about what's installed in your server. You just SCP, you know, or upload. However, you get your binary up there, it'll run, uh, and that's by default. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, fast compilation. You forget that it's a compiled language because it, it, you know, it actually compiles and runs you know, in the time that a scripting language would take to start as interpreter. So um, I hope that at least gave a flavor for the, the Go concurrency primitives and, you know, why as someone uh, writing Ruby, you might be interested in, you know, next time you run into a problem that uh, has a lot of concurrency um, or, you know, performance uh, limitations, Go might be um, something to look into. So any questions?
Oh, Same. and I forgot to mention, if you ask a question, you get a t-shirt. <laughs> also, there's a couple t-shirt options. Um, what yeah. size t-shirt would I get? <laughs> we have a lot of sizes. Uh, you can, like, we won't, we won't do it during the questions because it's problematic, but we have a lot of different sizes. Um, and David's going to hold up, David's going to hold up our two designs. Waiting from our time machine to, uh, we've got one. Ooh. Shield, awesome. You know, I got to ask about the one. So, yeah, the button sizes for the question. They're actually quality t-shirts. They're not, you know, some Hanes stuff. Um, Randall, um, on, you mentioned streaming over pipe instead of doing file based. Um, how, say you open up a pipe and you start streaming data to it, how are you doing the MD5 hash sizes as the file goes um, if you don't know how big it's going to be ahead of time? So you can do streaming MD5 hashes? I don't know. That's what I was asking you. Oh, uh, yeah. So uh, I guess uh, my answer is per trunk basis. Yeah. So you answer. Yeah. So uh, one of the nice things, um, you know, I sort of mentioned in passing, goes interfaces, um, and Gopher implements uh, a reader and writer interface. You can treat it just like a file object on an operating system, and the same thing is, applies for the hash uh, that's built in the standard library. It's a writer, so you simply write to the hash and then you call sum on it when you're done, and you get your MD5 hash out. And so that's done concurrent, you know, in parallel with everything else. And then you know, uploaded as a 32-byte you know, file to um, S3. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention your example about the command that used the tar dash, you know, the, the normal tar yes. invocation. That really lends itself well if you want to replace the dash Z with a GPG, you can actually GPG will encrypt at the same rate that uh, gzip will compress. So you could actually potentially have a cur client key and um, fully encrypt the archives going to and from your S3 and fit it in your current pipeline. Cool. So. Yeah, I mean, we, we use uh, like server-side encryption on Amazon. And uh, of course, all this is happening over SSL. Right. Um, but that's a really interesting okay. point. Extra stuff. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, when I've been piping stuff to gzip, or I guess in, the, in this case you're tarring it with gzip option, mm -hmm. I've found that on my servers at least, I'm limited to about 4 megabits a second. And um, there's a nice Linux utility, or general Unix utility, called TakeZ, so parallel. Ah, uh, yes. That's yeah, so awesome. parallel implementation of gzip. And it's like, I'm not too familiar with Amazon. But if you have mobile CPUs available, GZIP by default will only use one, ZP, one CPU, and this will use as many as you have. And um, he's definitely speed things up a lot. Yeah, I mean, it hasn't been a limitation. You know, we'll get uh, 110 megabytes per second uh, in 110. So basically, max out, you know, 900 plus megabits per second. Uh, we actually don't use the uh, GZIP option. And the reason is that we're using bare repos, so they're already compressed. Uh, so that may be why. Um, okay, so that was just an example. It, well, yeah, it was an example because you know you, you might ask why we're tarring uh, something without compressing it. I don't know. A lot of people tarred to compress, so I I changed it to just show that that is possible. Uh, and of course, you have to actually you have to specify what encryption mechanism you're using on the extraction when you're using a stream, which is. Uh, you never have to do that otherwise because it can't tell ahead of time, so it can't actually act on it. So, anyway. So, um, go ahead. Any specific uh, server requirements to be able to put Go on your server? You don't need Go on your server uh, because yeah. it's statically, there's all statically linked binaries. So, right, we don't run on our, we don't have Go on any of our servers. Uh, we just, Put a binary up there and it runs. So, what's the smallest Amazon instance to get a gigabit connection? Have you reduced your instances because it's so memory efficient? <laughs> no, because our our uh, our Rails app is not memory efficient. Um, <laughs> uh, so, no, we have not. Um, also, there's like there's things like I/O. Um, it, I haven't tried going down the ladder. Uh, a 2XL, like I said, is moderate on network. Like it, it's like they don't define that, and it's a gigabit. But I think it's more just that you share it with more 
uh, neighbors um, when you're on one of these instances, whereas like a 4XL, you pretty much have a dedicated box. Um, but I've tried it on like an M1X large, I've tried it on the M22XLs. I haven't tried it on like a micro, I don't think things would go well. <laughs> I mean, could this work be like split up different? Yeah, we're moving towards a system, uh, service oriented architecture. I mean, that's one of the, one of sort of our architectural shifts. Um, and that's certainly the case. Uh, but anytime you're moving tons of data, you kind of need to do it somewhat locally. Um, to do it efficiently. I, it I don't. I don't know like the actual use case. Like if your web app actually then has to like do something with like the entire set of it. Uh, yeah, I mean it's it's kind of an artifact that our web app is even responsible for the backups at this point. Um, mm -hmm. um, but like that code is running as this monolithic thing, so that's why you know I mentioned it. Yeah. What did you use for the presentation? Because was the like running Go code from a presentation was kind of cool. Oh yeah, I, I would have liked to use it more, but you know it doesn't really lend itself to this particular tool. Um, but it's a uh, tool that the Go team wrote called Present, and is written in Go, and it's in just HTML5 uh, web app. You know, like all the stuffs in HTML5, and uh, you just write basically a text file. Like I did this whole presentation in Vim. And then you just uh, include pieces of code from your application. And if they're runnable, you can say play. Actually, if you go to, I think it's play.golang.org, it's basically, you know, you can run any Go code, you know, with the exception of like massive IO, like you're not allowed to do that on their servers because it's they're on the Go servers. But if you just want to try out Go and write a program, you can do that on your phone, on your computer. Um, and it uses the same sort of technology where, you know, you write it, you can code it right there on the uh, browser and then run it. How familiar are you with how that works? Because I was inspecting it the other day using like a, it's been like Wireshark or whatever. Uh, and it was using some, you know, thread sleeps and some timing stuff to output things. But it was like they were using maybe a custom built version of like their IO library specifically yeah. for, for the, the Go playground. That was instead returning back like time sliced chunks of JSON for your output. But yeah, it actually uses WebSockets, which I'm not that familiar with, but it's something I believe was built um, uh, by the GoTo. It by didn't really look like WebSockets. Like it was actually giving you back a JSON response of okay. here's what happens at 0.1 millis, here's what happens at 0.1 seconds, here's what happens at 0.2 seconds, here's what happens at 0.3 seconds. So the answer is I'm not really familiar, but there is a GoTalk on it, on talks.goline.org, on the, play, on the, on the present. No, on present, okay. on the present stuff, which, so maybe maybe not on play. So yeah, I don't know, but it's open source, so. Yeah, yeah I didn't get that far. I was just looking at it. Yeah, I think you've gotten further than I have. But yeah, it is it is cool, and I mean, I didn't really show any slides on this, but uh, just to wrap up, the uh, you know if you want to check it out, you go to tour.golang.org. You can do it on your phone. Like you know, the barrier to entry could not be lower. Uh, you can do it lying in bed, you can check it out, and uh, it takes you through a tour of the language pretty comprehensively with some exercises and stuff, uh, and you can run all that stuff in the browser, and then, um, you know, see, see if you like it. It's a very minimalist language, so, uh, you know, very different from Ruby, but uh, one thing that's been interesting, interesting about Go over the last four years, you know, it's the fourth year now since it was released uh, last week was the anniversary or maybe this week um, is that although it was built to solve the problems that the you know the people that built it were frustrated with C++ and Java which were the primary languages at Google um, the adoption rate has been much higher among you know the dynamic language communities Python Ruby um, Rob Pike has a talk called uh, less is more, where he talks about why he thinks that is, but I'm not going to speculate on it. Um, but it's kind of interesting, and you know, it's definitely proven pretty popular. A lot of uh, Ruby-ish places like Heroku are using it more for some of their stuff, and you know, seem to like it. So, anything else? Otherwise, you know more code for real. I do. I was a hammer trade operator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. I'm not sure I would choose that moniker again, but you know, <laughs> you're stuck with it. 
So yeah, that's it. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL RUG videos playlist.